blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus. I think we sung about Jesus. Sometimes you miss things, and if you're anything like me, you're paying attention, but then you go, oh, we sing about Jesus a lot. Well, that's a good idea. I heard that's a good thing, so praise the Lord. We're going to talk about Jesus this morning out of his word. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. I'm going to get into chapter number 10, give you a little uh, highlight and reminder of where we've been uh, as 9 and 10, excuse me, 8 and 9 tied together to 10. And uh, we're still in a place where, of course, Paul is exhorting and teaching the church at Corinth. And uh, he brings in his old brethren that were Jews uh, long ago and also brings in, of course, the terminology of brethren to his brethren in Christ and the church. And he brings in some history, brings in some past, of course, hits the present time of the church. And then, of course, uh, we see where if you can just get some things again, once again, straightened out, understand what I have for you that Paul the Apostle is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, pointing to, uh, throughout the Word of God, pointing to putting God first and seeing that Hey, you could have a fulfilling future. You could fulfill all that God has for the church. One day, of course, we will fulfill all that when he calls us out of here and, and the coming of Christ is coming imminently. But until then, we've got to really truly look at the word of God, maybe in a, in a fresh new way or a, uh, maybe a revival heart attitude. God, please. Revive my heart for the things of you and not the things of me. And understand that as these things are written, 54, 50, uh, 55, 56 A.D., we realize the young church at Corinth uh, went through some of the same things that you're, uh, you and I are going through in the 21st century. And again, as our study has taken us, again, in 1 Corinthians, there's uh, letter after letter, epistle after epistle written by Paul the Apostle, and of course, uh, Paul writing to Timothy as well in pastoral epistles saying, these are the warnings, these are the things that I need to alert you to, and uh, God's very good at giving us warnings. Uh, God doesn't necessarily surprise us like you think he does. He lets you know way ahead of time how this life in my son Jesus Christ is going to be, and then all of a sudden we're surprised that we're going through trials. We're going through testings, and he said, they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You will live in a time, as Jesus said to his apostles in John chapter number 14, 15, 16, if you love me, they will hate you. And so you're going to go through a life that on one side will be filled with trials and, and testings, temptations, and of course, the Bible teaches that God does not tempt us to sin, but he tempts us to have faith in him, to follow after him. And as we grow and we mature and we get closer to him, which is a big part of the study, you and I need to advance from the spot that we're at now to the next spot that God would have for us. And I say that often, to be better and to be healthier. Well, you don't need to advance to the next spot that I need to be advanced to by the Lord and him saying, hey, this is what you need to do, Mark, and this is the growth process that I'm taking you through, it's going to be the same, obviously, for all of us to be predestinated to be conformed to the image of Christ. But in my particular place, being saved 39 years, almost 40, having the calling of God in this particular way, in this particular office, there's a difference in what I have to do next. But what God wants to do next in every one of us, again, is to make you like his son, Jesus. So, What's stopping you and me from moving the next step of advancing our growth, of saying, hey, God, uh, I want you to grow me some more. I'm not satisfied. I am not going to be complacent. I'm not going to just say, okay, God, I'm, <laughs> I've reached it. Paul is constantly speaking in this letter about the dangers of being complacent complicit and, and just doing the things of the flesh that we want to do and then becoming complacent in our growth. 
In fact, what I put up here, first of all, is this, referencing chapter 8 and 9 a little bit. As we grow, as we mature, liberty and conscience allow us to do more things because we have the spiritual strength and better spiritual judgment. Say, so does that mean when it says more things, does that mean that now I can do stuff for myself and my flesh? No, that's not what the statement is saying. It's saying, hey, as we mature, liberty and conscience allow us to do more things. You get into the Word of God, someone may walk you through the Word of God. You might be going through a disciple-making relationship. You might be going through some Bible study, some fellowship, some small group. You might be going to teaching on Sunday morning and it's specifically geared into a place where you're going, okay, okay, God, you're really teaching me. And Paul is saying to Corinth and saying to us by the Spirit of God, I want to continue to teach you. That's what the Lord's saying. I want you to spiritually grow so that you're freer. Freer in the Lord in terms of more free than you are in Christ. No, freer in your growth to say, I can let that go. That's not so important. I can see where that can trip me up. I can see where God, you're showing me because when my liberty gets greater, our love and my love can get stronger. I'm reminded of what it says in 1 Corinthians 8, 9. But take heed, though, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Remember, as you grow, and some of you are more spiritually mature than others. I didn't say all of us have arrived. None of us have. But God's saying, hey, you're maybe in a growth layer or a growth time of life and a season of life where you're not maybe a baby Christian anymore. Maybe you are a baby Christian and you want to be a little bit more grown up in the Lord. Well, God's saying, hey, there are people around that you can see that are good examples to follow after. But remember, the greatest example you can follow after is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know that as you grow in conceptually understanding the Word of God... Theologically, of course, you understand the Word of God in relationships and the, the church of God and the body of Christ. You go, okay, my behavior, our behavior and conduct are a result of us just growing, of maturing in the love of the Lord and maturing in the love of the brethren. Love never fails, I heard. It's God's love that never fails. On the other side of that, just remember this. Also, our responsibility to be an example to the weaker brother then becomes greater. Although our liberty is greater, as I said a minute ago, our love must grow stronger. God's saying, look, he who began this good work in you, he's going to complete it one day. You can be persuaded that he is able to keep that which he's committed unto you against that day. And the more mature you are as a Christian, oftentimes you say, hey, that doesn't... In fact, I would say that less and less certain things bother me that once used to really, really bother me. And I'm talking about just, hey, the testimony of others is very, very important. But the testimony that I carry with me is much more important to the Lord. Oftentimes, in a younger time of my life, I was always able to see everyone else's hiccups and things that they were doing wrong or their testimony. You grow in the Lord a little bit and you go, I'm going to pray through that. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to do all I can to have them grow a little bit more. And that's what God wants to do. In fact, he's saying in his word, guess what? You know what? As it says in 1 Corinthians 8, 13, we should be eager to limit our liberty at any time for other people. I'm able to, I'm, I'm grown up, but hey, I can let some things go. I can just not have to do that certain thing because I want to help my fellow believer. I don't need to jump in on that or weigh in on stuff or say, well, you need to listen to my opinion. You know, I, I know a lot more about God than you do. And uh, 
Let me tell you how the mess, all the messy things that people have done. Sometimes we just need to read the scripture and say, as it says in 1 Corinthians 8.13, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. And the context being that these old Corinthian people would sacrifice stuff the old days to those old gods and those old idols and that fleshly meat would be around and they would grab it and they would eat it and still not know that it was something bad. And so the mature believer has to say, you know, that's, that's, that's fine for now. They'll grow into that. All, the, all those old things will go away as they grow in the Lord because the Lord tells us that as he grows us, we will desire the things of him more than the things of our flesh. And that's where Paul's saying, hey, in chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, into chapter 10, your maturity, your growth is really, really good and it's strong. But be careful that you don't use that liberty now that you're really set in a good place in the Lord. And you've grown in your prayer life and all that to say, okay, now let me come into the condemnation circle where I can really tell everybody what they're doing wrong. Or, in my liberty, I can do some things and not be bound by the law, and then my younger brother's offended because they're thinking, oh, you can do that? How about if I just decide that my brother's growth is a whole lot more important because I believe that God's love never fails. That, as we look in verse number 10, and we see the setup of chapters number uh, chapter number. 10 and we see the setup of chapters 8 and 9 we realize hey you know what love does never fail it is Paul speaking again about God's love never failing it's some good commands here some good warnings here some good directions but ultimately he's saying look this is what you can do to grow in me you see, in chapter 10, Paul warned the Corinthians not to lose their spiritual edge. He said, look, I want you to stay on point. I want you to stay with me here. I want you to say, okay, don't lose your spiritual edge. What does that mean? Well, spiritual growth and maturity should lead to more sanctified choices, not less. I'd love to be more like Jesus, not just say, well, if he has to make me more like his son Jesus because that's what it says in the scriptures, I'll do that. No, it's, I'm going to wake up today and say, wow, I would love for you to change my thinking process, God. I would love for you to fill me up a little bit more with your word and your spirit that I received when I got saved so that the fruit of the spirit would be more evident in my life. And the spiritual growth and maturity that I have should lead to more. Not get to a point where, again, I'm complacent. I'm spiritually comfortable. I'm all set. In fact, I have so much confidence in myself, I end up having confidence in the flesh. Our warning remains today. Confidence in the flesh and complacency over our relationship with the Lord often leads to falling away because of sin and idolatry. That's what Paul's covering today in chapter 10. Again, he's saying, look, as I cover so many of these things here and so many things here, and, and here I am in chapter number 10 in my letter to the church of Corinth, let me bring another warning from the Lord. Mark your confidence in your flesh, your confidence in your rituals, your confidence in your religious traditions, your confidence in all that you've learned in the Word, your confidence in the position that you have, your confidence in how you've been saved almost 40 years, your complacency over your relationship with me, that you know I've forgiven you of all, but yet you distance me like Jonah did, by the way. And we think for a moment in the case of Jonah or Abraham or so many others that they were just fine with the spot that they were in. Even though God said, I want to do something with you. I want to do something through you. I want to do something that's of my will. But yet, as in the case of Jonah, he didn't give God permission for quite a long time. You see, complacency and confidence in the flesh 
can lead me to a place where I just go, okay. Idolatry. I become the one that I worship the most. Flesh. I give my flesh a Pasadena. Here, take a pass. Have a little swim in the deep end of foolishness and see how it will affect you, Mark, as God gives me that free will when he says, Mark, I just don't want you to go down that road because I love you so much. And I am telling you, if you lean on your own understanding and you don't acknowledge me in all your ways, then the past that I have for you today, they'll get you. It says in Philippians 3, Paul wrote it, of course. It's up on the screen. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Remember, the spiritual circumcision. When you are born again, you are spiritually cut away unto the Lord. The circumcision he's speaking of is saying, hey, we which are in God are in the spirit and we rejoice in Christ Jesus. We don't have any confidence in this flesh. He says in verse number four, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. And remember, if you can remember the context of this passage of Scripture, he starts talking about himself in a not-so-positive way, but rather saying, hey, if any man could think of himself, hath whereof he must trust in his flesh, I the more circumcised eighth day, stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrews of Hebrews, is touching the law of Pharisee. He knew it all. He had it all down in his flesh. Hey, I was a great person in God before I met Jesus Christ. But boy, I found out after I met Jesus Christ that my flesh is not trustworthy. I can't be favoring it. I can't have any confidence in it. And though I think I'm something, Paul says I'm nothing. He says the things that were gained, I counted loss. Yea, doubtless that I count all things but loss for the excellency of knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. What does he say? For whom? For Christ I suffered the loss of all things. Why? That I may win Christ. Loss of all things of the flesh. We ought to lose our confidence in our flesh. But as the scripture says, <laughs> in that spiritual circumcision, I, I worship God in the spirit and I rejoice in Christ Jesus. He is the one that gets the credit. I have confidence in him to work in me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. So it's better to trust in the Lord. It's better to put confidence in the Lord. Yes, it is better. And for me today, as we go into chapter number 10, as for you and me together as a church, for all of you, think of what Paul's saying at the end of 1 Corinthians 9 when he says, I keep my body under subjection. I, uh, excuse, excuse me. I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I put up here on the screen Paul's words in 927, help us to escape the strong pull to follow after our flesh when faced with temptation to fall away. This man said, and we covered this at the end last week, look, I'm going to subject myself to the life of Christ. The gospel's going to compel me. I'm going to go after him and what he has. That may mean I lose everything. But the one thing I don't want to lose is my relationship with Christ. I don't want to be found a castaway. You know what a castaway is? Exactly what it says. Would you want to have the God of the universe who saved your soul say, I can't use you anymore because you're not usable anymore. I've cast you away because you don't preach the gospel. You don't teach the gospel. You don't lead anyone to Jesus Christ. In fact, you do not subject yourself to me at all. You haven't put your body in subjection to me. Then we become castaways. Would you want that to happen to you? It's like what Paul, excuse me, what Jesus said to his disciples. If you don't hate everything, all that other stuff in your own life, 
you cannot be my disciple. Those are riveting words from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I say it often. It floors me. I need to keep my body under subjection. I need to bring it into subjection because I can get myself in a lot of trouble. My arrogance and my pride, my selfishness, my confidence in my own flesh, my mouth. Every one of us. And he says, you know, there's no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. He's saying it to the believer. And that's why he says in that passage, and that's just the simple title of our message today, he has a way to escape. It's his way, though. It's his way. His way of escape. Just like this one, his way. What did Jesus say to the disciples preparing to go home to see his father? But in between this talk he's having with the disciples and this crucifixion, suffering, passion of Jesus, he says in John 14, If any man will come after me, excuse me, forgive me, wrong place. John 14. Download. I had to go download it. Okay. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is saying that that is the way. Just as he's saying today to you and me in this letter by Paul the Apostle, I will make a way for you to escape that she may be able to bear it. When you get into a place where it's temptation, when it's temptation to sin or temptation and a trial of faith, what the Word of God is telling you and me here in this context is God has a way. It's His way of escape. That's where we're going to go today for just the next few minutes. We're going to just take 13 verses today, and we're going to just go after these 13, make three little simple lesson points behind the statement, His way of escape, and see what the Scriptures will teach us today. Line upon line as always, verse by verse. Join me, 1 Corinthians 10. It'll be up on the screen for you, but you have your Bibles. You can just flop them open there. Verse number 1. It's on page 1428 if you're trying to find it. Here we go. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye be ignorant. I don't want you to lack knowledge in this matter. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Yeah. Nation of Israel. Baptism. Pretty cool, huh? There you go. First baptism mentioned in the, the Bible. One of seven you can find. Think about what went on there. They were immersed by God, in God, by the great prophet Moses, who was second to none as leader and prophet. Of course, maybe Samuel will be mentioned as a a great type in the Old Testament close to him. But here this is, this beautiful piece that Paul's writing in the church, letter to Corinth, saying, brethren, Jews that have been converted to Jesus, so brethren as a Jew, brethren as a believer, he puts this one and melds it together. Watch what he teaches them. He says they take of spiritual meat and spiritual drink. Verse 3, and did all eat the same spiritual meat? Yes, we are having and partaking of God's spiritual food. Verse 4, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Aha. We got something here, don't we? You see, they partook and they didn't even know of the Lord Jesus Christ. And being baptized into him. They also, as they know of the drink that they took, of the rock, that you remember that Moses was punished for. 
And God gave judgment upon him because he struck the rock for drink because he was angry at the people of God. But that rock was providing the drink for them to drink, but it was spiritual drink because they had no idea that they had tempted Christ. We'll find that here in a moment. Verse number 5. And with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples. To the intent, we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. So it's pretty safe for the church to get an accounting of how, hey, the nation Israel messed up. Look at what they did. They were adulterers. They were murmurers. Well, of course, he's speaking to the church as well, saying, hey, this is what happened back there with those peeps. You guys, you get the same difficulties with God as well. And as we read it today by the Spirit of God, he's saying, here's your warning that I'm giving you these examples to the intent. What's my intent? That you do them? No, that we should not lust after evil things as they are lusted. You know how you give an example to someone of something bad that could happen if they do such a thing? And you're thinking, please don't take that example of me giving you something that I don't want you to do so you can actually go do it. We know the old story. You tell a kid, don't put their finger in the light socket. What do they do? Put their finger in the light socket. And sometimes some of them lick it. You know, that's one another one of those things when you grow up. Moms and dads, you know, we like, ah! Grandpas and grandmas are going, <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> it's fun being a grandfather. Verse 7 and 8, 9, 10. He goes down through the list. Here they are. Idolatry first. Number 7. Neither be ye adulterers, as were some of them. As it is written, it says, as some of them, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Exodus 32, Yes. Some of you have a reference Bible that might show you that reference. Verse number 8, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. How about the nation of Israel in the book of Numbers and how they perverted their relationship with God and went after other gods, but then they also committed fornication and wicked, awful, evil sin. Verse number 9, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. Also the accounting in Numbers as we see the accounting by Moses. Remember as how they tempted Christ and went against Christ and went against the rock. And so God said, fine, I'll send you some fiery little serpents and they'll be biting you and many of you will die. Remember? It says in verse number 10, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh, he standeth, take heed, lest what a great verse in the Bible. Watch out. Don't get too full of yourself, Mark. Don't get too full of your flesh. Don't get too settled in on where you're at in the Spirit of God with your walk. Wherefore, let him that thinketh, he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Verse 13, one of those verses. These two verses, they'd be great for your memorization package. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able? He won't let you get in such a fix. What will he do, it says in this verse? But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it? Now, Father, for the next few minutes, I pray that you will, in the name of Jesus, by the teaching power of the Holy Spirit, verse by verse by verse, really bring to light the things that we need corporately and collectively, as much, even more so, personally, for every brother and sister here. 
I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. His way of escape. We just read that highlight verse. Just pause for a moment. Just think. Temptation comes. Temptation comes, as Paul told us, to do that which I would not do. And then the temptation comes to not do that which I ought to do. There's things that we are to do in and of the Lord. Read my Bible. Spend time in communion with the Lord. Worship Him. Fall in love with Him. Forgive others in everything. Give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you and me. So I'm to give thanks. These are things that God says, just do them. And I'm tempted not to do them. Now, I know I'm the only one in a, in a room of over 100 people that is tempted to not do them. Correct? All of you, you never face the temptation like that. So maybe you're on the other side of this type of temptation where it's, man, I better not do that. I better not do that. I better not say that word. I better not speak that thought. I better get that thought in my mind under control and cast down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against God. I better get that under control there, or I'm going to do something that God says you should not do. I'm going to say something, and I'm going to go somewhere and do that which I would not do. You see, the temptation is real. And he's saying, I have a way of escape. I have a simple way of escape. Well, I've got you three simple ones today. They're going to relate to the passage of Scripture. We'll walk through them and be done. My first one is this. His way of escape involves proper thinking. So I'm going to talk about proper thinking. I speak of that often because I know that this mind right here can mess with us. But if I get good thoughts, if I get some good thinking, if I get some good God thinking, I'm doing better. So his way of escape involves proper thinking over God's track record of favor on his people. Look in the first four verses. Do you think there's, that's just a miniaturized version of the track record of God and the nation of Israel and in the church. His way of escape is to say, look, would you please remember me when you're in a fix? Do you remember how I provided for you when you thought I was going, wasn't going to? Remember when you got angry at me and shook your fist at me and you said that I did not take care of you, Mark? I've always taken care of you. But you took... But you... God has a track record for every one of us. A track record for the nation of Israel. So many times he forgave them. He drew them back to him. He sent Israel prophet after prophet, man of God after man of God, messenger of God, the angel of the Lord who was the Lord precarnate. He sent Joshua. He sent David. He sent Man after man. He used Esther to save the nation. God always came through. He's never stopped coming through. God has a track record for you and me. How is it that my memory is so short? Because I'm like these people here. And I need to be reminded by Paul the Apostle, by the Holy Spirit of God, to say, hey, Mark, I blessed you. I fulfilled promises for you. I've given favor for you. I've give, I have given given provision in times when you didn't have. I am good. And I've always been good. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Deuteronomy 32, 4. That rock was Christ. The track record of Jesus Christ, the track record of God, the Father, God Almighty, the track record of the Holy Spirit of God at work. You see, I see it this way in another way. The forgetfulness of the past by the brethren that struggled to remember God's blessings, it need not be repeated. But learn from. We say it a lot. On this earth with like fleshly matters. Hey, 
you did that thing, it worked that one time, don't do it again. Hey, you made that mess up there. You tell, as parents, you tell your children, remember last time you did that? <laughs> remember last time you tried to put six animal crackers in your mouth? That's my grandson, Gabe. Yeah. Remember last time when you tried to jam another one in there? Yeah. And your mother had to remove them one by one so that you could enjoy one at a time? But spiritually speaking, the forgetfulness by us of the past, <laughs> because we struggle with God's blessings. We, 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 we forget what he has done after time. I just want you to consider for a moment, just 30 seconds, how he has blessed you today. Blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. And you and I, instead of learning from those blessings, we repeat our past behavior. Our overconfidence without accountability will find us in a place of irresponsibility for our growth. Our overconfidence without accountability of the Word of God, the Spirit of God, the people of God will find us in a place of irresponsibility with our growth. When we are responsible for our own personal growth, God put so much in the Word of God for so many reasons, and one of them was so that you and I would grasp the hope that we have in Christ more and more. It says in Romans 15, I just put this one up, there's many, many references, so the Lord just led me here. Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. They were written for our learning. So many people love to learn and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. In this ministry, I see so many people learning so they can grow and be more in Christ, and I love that about so many of you. I I'm so thankful but learning more Bible lessons to a point we go, wait a minute, what about if you just look at the history of the behavior and go, wait a minute, God wrote all those things for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So the Scriptures do more than just give you a cerebral, nice little knowledge uh, lesson for you. They, they give you a way of walking with patience and hope. They give you a way of walking in comfort and hope. They give you a way of living in a different way. Go, it's not just, oh, everything's going to be okay. It's deeper than that. He can put peace in a place where you're angry. He can put calm in a place where you're anxious. He can put joy in a place where you thought, I am so miserable. I hate my life. But I gave you the joy of the Lord when I saved your soul. No, God, I'm so angry and so mad and so sad. And that's real. And he says, from his scripture, I wrote the things that I wrote for many reasons. And one of them is that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. When it seems to be the worst you can still have hope. Hope can take you a long way. The second thing I see in his way of escape is this. His way of escape involves proper thinking over God's gift of liberty in his salvation. It's going to reference the next few verses. He say, well, why is it in there? He says, wait a minute. Proper thinking over God's perfect gift of liberty. It's perfect in that you are fulfilled, you are free in Christ, you have liberty in Christ to love, to serve, to walk in these places of his salvation. So you don't have to be an adulterer. But when you were lost, that's all you knew to do. You don't have to be a murmur, 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 murmur. Did I just say murmur, murmur, murmur? That wasn't on purpose, I gotta tell you. I might need some sugar. It's getting low. I do not need to be a murmurer. I don't need to tempt Christ. I don't need to commit fornication. I do not need to walk down that place because God's perfect gift of liberty in his salvation puts me in a place. So I've got to think that way. I've got to think about it. I've got to think that, verse number 6 says, Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. I mentioned 
The idolater thing is terrible. It is awful. It's what the nation of Israel did. And they turned their back on the Lord and they committed idolatry. They made a calf and so many other times that they committed adultery. Again, I mentioned Exodus 32. We end up worshiping those idols we should not, especially ourselves. Fornication coming from Numbers 25. There's so much in there. In the nation of Israel back then, Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab, and they called the people unto the sacrifices of their God, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods, and on and on and went. That's just one example of the nation of Israel committing wicked fornication against God. Verse number 9 talks about tempting Christ. Numbers 21. The Israelites didn't, didn't realize they were tempting Christ when they complained again in Numbers 21. God said, okay, fine, I'll work. My work. And it says that this curse came down upon them. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. They bit the people and much of, the, of Israel died. The only way the plague was stopped was to be stopped if Moses did what? He made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole. A precursor to the Lord Jesus Christ will be lifted up in crucifixion for us. And of course it says there that they murmured. Oh, did they murmur. From Numbers 14 and on and on, there's so much murmuring there. The Israelites murmured because of the great obstacles that stood before them. That kind of sounds like us sometimes. We murmur often. I'll say it a different way like this, as I said earlier in the other statement. The carnality of the present by the brethren that struggle to honor God's liberty Sometimes we struggle to honor his liberty. It's a beautiful liberty. We're free in Christ. We don't have to be bound by the stuff of the flesh. I know it draws us, but he's saying, no temptation is taken you, but such is common to man. I'm here to make a way for you to escape. He's saying, hey, the brother in the struggle to honor God's liberty need not to be accepted, but repented of. Okay, I'm here with you. I, I know that, that that was a messy thing, and it was now just need to repent of that. Spend the rest of your life honoring the Lord and not say, well, I accepted that I messed up once. I can keep on messing up. Ah, my life is toast for the Lord. It ought not to be that way. The nation of Israel is being used as an example to the church of the living God to show in the New Testament church how we can learn from these examples. As it, as it says there, that we would not murmur, that we would not tempt Christ, that we not commit fornication and be idolaters because we have this beautiful liberty. James chapter number one. And I'll go back there to finish. So if you want to put your finger there, James chapter number one. And I'll be using this for a couple of things as we finish up our message. James one, verse number two. My brother, and count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. It goes on and on and talks about this relationship in the Lord Jesus Christ that we can have with God to receive wisdom. I know Bobby's teaching on that on Wednesday nights. It says in verse number 6, ask in faith, not wavering. Verse number 7, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. If what? He wavers and he's double-minded and he doesn't know whether or not God can deliver or not. And God's saying, I can deliver. Sin is real. You are tempted to walk away from me. The nation of Israel did it. The church of God did it. Hey, I'm here, church of Corinth. I'm here, church at First Bible Baptist Church. I'm alongside of you saying, hey, I provided a way for you to escape. I can get you to a place of living in the perfect gift of liberty in your salvation I gave you, which is my salvation in Jesus that I gave to you. And lastly, his way of escape involves proper thinking over God's timely word of warning. I started out here and I'm ending. 
I do that often when I teach and preach. His way of escape involves proper thinking over God's timely word of warning, and it's by his mercy. It is by his mercy, isn't it? We know. We know. I know often you pray in the same vein because it's true in God's word that his mercy, his benefits, they load us up daily. It's by his mercy that God's timely word of warning comes. I'm warning you. Verse number 11. Look at this beautiful warning to finish up. 11, 12, and 13. Now all these things happen unto them for end samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. I read these two verses with meaning as we read them through a few moments ago. Let me finish with them, make a couple comments, and turn to James chapter number 1. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Oh my. I would just throw this in as an asterisk as mature believers. Be careful that as you stand and you pick at others. Because the bottom line for the church at Corinth is that they had a big disparity between those that knew how to walk with the Lord and those that did not. And they had a messy place that Paul the Apostle loved them so much that he wanted them to favor the things of the Lord to see the escape that God provided and not get so much confidence in your past or your present that the future could be messed up. It says in verse number 13, again, no temptation hath taken you. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. God is faithful. God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. The commitment to the future for the brethren that will struggle to trust God's faithfulness. I talked about the brethren looking to the past, the brethren looking to the present, and the brethren that will struggle to trust God's faithfulness in the future. It need not merely survive, but it can thrive. It need not just sit there and say, okay, my commitment goes back and forth, and I don't know, and I just really cannot do this. I barely get by, and I understand that because I have lived there. I get you. But it need not have to be that way. It need not be that when the next temptation comes to say I've had enough, or the next temptation, oh, God, this life with you is so tough. Or the next temptation when you say, oh gosh, everybody around me is falling away and I don't know what to do, Lord. <laughs> and he'll say, do you remember a guy named Elijah? Who got scared of a woman named Jezebel? He wasn't even afraid of those that <laughs> were at Mount Carmel worshiping the idols. He was more afraid of her taking his life. And he's one of the mighty men of the word. This is us. Believers in the Lord, faith that wavers, and what I'm looking at there in that statement is, hey, we're going to struggle. The future, those of you younger and are going to be around when I am gone and others, hey, you're going to struggle with the trusting God's faithfulness, but you don't need to just get by. You can thrive. James chapter number one. I finish here. I read a little bit. I will pick it up in verse nine and finish with verse 12. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich is he, excuse me, in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. The things of the earth, they just. So also shall the rich man fade away in his, bless, in his ways. Hey, the stuff of the rich man, they're just going to fade away. But here's the stuff important. Ah, I think we sung a song about this here a little while ago. The reward. The crown of life. Verse number 12 is up on the screen. I want you to read it while I read it. 
Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. This is the stuff that God puts before you to prove him in you. To prove him even beside you when you know that you're not even in a good place. He says, blessed is the man that just, just endure this temptation. Endure this trial. Endure this test. Don't try to look for the answer out of it right now. Just endure it, endure it, endure it, endure it. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Oh, you can fall in love an awful lot more when you go through a rough time. What else you got? You're going to get so angry that just eats your lunch. You're going to become bitter and just takes away your soul. You're going to start getting nasty. I've tried them all. They don't work, I promise you. But you may have to try it yourself. I I know, we, we're hard-headed. I mentioned it earlier, sticking your finger in the light socket. Some of you stick your finger in the light socket every week. Even the Lord told you don't do it. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, I know. And there's your beautiful father saying, hey, if we would just endure this trial, and you would just trust in me, will you just increase your faith? Will you go to the scriptures and read Psalm 27, Psalm 23, Psalm 31, Psalm 34. Pick a psalm! Read a proverb of the wisest man on the face of the earth who said, hey, <laughs> trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy way acknowledge him. Ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. Your paths will be laid out. And he will direct them for you. Even when you think, when you're being tried, I don't see any crown here. He said, I'll, I'll give that to you later. Because he's promised it to you. And he's promised it to me. If you just love him, it comes full circle. I know James wrote this. But Paul wrote similar language. It says up on the screen to finish up our message today in our prayer time this. We've been warned and we've been directed. We, we've been provided and protected. I've provided a way of escape, he says, for that temptation to live ungodly. So here's our prayer time today. Lord, Lord, Father in heaven and Jesus, may your word, put the capital one there, your living word, Jesus, and your warning be our escape. Once again, he'll keep on giving you an escape. And another one, and another one, and another one, if you just look to him. And if you just endure that temptation, to be tried, just love him. He will love you through in ways that, oh, it's so great to know his love on the other side. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus in this time of invitation. We could say no more but to say we love you because you first loved us. God is love. We understand that from your word. And I thank you for your word today, teaching us that your way, it's his way, your way of escape that we need to take. I pray for my brothers and sisters as they pray this moment, these next few moments in their chairs or up at the altar, wherever. God, you just meet them. Walk them through and reveal to them once again as they cry out to you, Lord, Lord, would you give me a way to escape again? And I know, Lord, as your word says and promises, you'll never leave or forsake in Jesus' name. Please stand. Please stand. Please respond right now. Come to the altar. Come and respond to what the Lord has put on your heart. Maybe pray with someone there in your seat. Pray, sit down, kneel right there, I, wherever. Just take the time to pray, please, as the music plays.